Hey, good morning, everyone. As we uh, continue through God's Word, I've got. Uh, I'm going to break this up into two parts. We're going to do an overview of Second Kings chapters eight and nine today, and then I'll have a second second uh, video on Jezebel and some of the specific ways that uh, she pops up later in history after the. The, the queen slash widow herself has been destroyed in 2 Kings chapter 9, as was prophesied by God when uh, she uh, stole by force and murder Naboth's vineyard and gave it to her husband Ahab. Uh, and some of the applications that we make today and, and even into the future uh, with, with her uh, idolatry and witchcraft. So uh, two different videos for the same day, but uh, today, uh, right now for this video we'll just do an overview of chapters 8 and 9 as we typically do. Uh, in these Bible study videos, just pick out a few things that God can teach us, and then I trust that you at home, uh, gathered around God's Word, that He's showing you and, 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 and pulling out to you some amazing things that either never occurred to me or I didn't have time to get into, and that's what's awesome about Bible study is it's all, it's all the Word of God, and it, it's all useful. Uh, I think it's 1 Timothy 3, maybe 15, all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable uh, for doctrine and uh, reproof. So uh, it's it's all good. This entire book is all good if we rightly divide it. Study to show ourselves approved. It's all God's Word. Okay, uh, we have in chapter 8 verse 1 the woman who had built uh, Elisha the uh, the prophet's chamber and uh, whose son had, had come very late in her and her husband's uh, lives, uh, supernaturally late in fact, and then who had died as a young man when he went out to the, his father and cried, my head, my head, um, that Elisha uh, laid upon and uh, became a mirror image of and raised from the dead. So that, uh, and this was a good and godly woman. Uh, Elisha told her, now remember at the end of the last chapter, chapter 7, we have the spoiling of the Syrian army. They had uh, left in fear and in, in haste because God's heavenly army, those, those uh, fiery horses and chariots had thundered through the valley and they were so afraid that they just left everything, ran from their tents and ran for the hills to hide and and uh, and, and Israel went out and spoiled so they got uh, they got the food they needed, they got new clothes, they got gold and silver, they got all kinds of awesome things, they got horses and, and uh, mules and asses and, and uh, so God blessed them in that way but the beginning of chapter 8 it says uh, for the Lord hath called for a famine and it shall come also come upon the land seven years. So a seven-year famine sent for and decreed by God. And he uh, tells this godly woman that had, uh, she and her husband had taken such great care of him uh, that she needs to get out of, get out of the land and, and go survive and live somewhere. So she goes to Palestine where the Philistines uh, dwell. And then at the end of the famine, uh, she decides to come back uh, it says in, in verse 3, it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. So she had abandoned uh, the, the property and the house and everything and just uh, gone to stay alive, gone to survive in, in uh, the land of the Philistines. And it's, it just so happened, just by coincidence, in verse 4, the king talked with uh, Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha, saying, tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to her king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And the king asked the woman, uh, and when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. So God uh, restored, in a sense, the years that the locusts ate up. It was a famine, so uh, God, God restored to her the land and the, and the productivity of it and her house to live in, as well as the fruit of that land that she had not partaken of for the last seven years. So God's really in the, in the business of pouring blessings out. Uh, and uh, so I, I really love that, uh, that uh, it would be enough if we were just children of God and and uh, could know his uh, by his Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ, fellowship with him, work and labor in his fields, and uh, look forward one day to gathering in praise and worship and adoration around his throne. That would all be enough. But in the meantime, he's, he blesses us with so much more uh, spiritual and uh, tangible or earthly blessings, and I'm just so grateful for that. You know, these, uh, these coincidences, 
coincidences keep popping up through Scripture. There, uh, later on in the book of uh, Esther, uh, we're going to find out that just the time when Queen Esther and her uncle Mordecai and all the Jews uh, living uh, in this foreign land was just about the time they needed special favor from the king to preserve their lives and their nation. The king couldn't sleep one night and called for a reading of the uh, of the, the the annals of his uh, reign over over this kingdom. And it just so happened they got to the part where Esther's uncle Mordecai had saved his life. He found out a plot that was against the king's life and told it. And and uh, upon further investigation, they found that these men were were seeking to uh, take the king's life. And uh, and so just the time they needed the king's grace and favor. Uh, he he was reminded about something that Mordecai had done uh, a long time ago, and and uh, his heart was then turned and disposed to giving Esther, Mordecai, and their nation, their people, that special grace and favor. So God really works uh, behind the scenes sometimes to orchestrate things. And we would call them coincidences, but uh, I think the people of God can safely uh, refer to them as divine appointments. Uh, now. <clears throat> Then Elisha, uh, it says in verse 7, came to Damascus, and Benadad, the king of Syria, was sick. It was told him, saying, The man of God has come thither. So, uh, so the king uh, said unto his servant uh, Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, Shall I recover of this disease? Uh, so uh, at least he's asking the right source, but we're going to have another instance here of God misleading someone, misguiding someone. So... Um, that's tragic in a sense, but uh, if we stick to his his written word, we can't be misled. Uh, you know, it's when we fall prey to our own feelings or our own opinions or stuff that people have told us in the name of God uh, and follow that as God's word rather than examining all things according to his perfect and preserved word that uh, we can be deceived and misled. So let's be very careful that uh, we hold all teachings, including uh, preaching, my preaching, whoever's preaching to you in the name of God, that, uh, that you do as the Bereans did and examine the scriptures to see if these things be so. Uh, so anyway, uh, what, it, what Elisha told this man, Hazael, is go back to your king and say unto him in verse 10, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord has showed me that he shall surely die. So uh, the truth was, as, as God showed Elisha, uh, that the king was going to die of this disease, but he said, go and, and uh, give him some smooth and flattering words of, of uh, word, words of false hope, if you will, that he's going to recover. Uh, it says in 11, in verse 11, he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. Their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children and rip up their women with child. Uh, and Hazael said, But what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. And so Elisha says that uh, as the king of our enemies... Uh, you're going to do some horrible things. You're going to break down our strongholds. Uh, you're going to uh, slay our young men with, with the sword in battle, dash our children, and uh, rip up the women carrying uh, with child. So just <laughs> the enemy of my enemy is not always my friend. Uh, let's be very careful. Uh, God may use others as instruments to, uh, to dispose of our enemies and to... And to uh, do away with them, but perhaps what comes up in, in, in our former enemy's place is something that's even worse. Um, then, uh, we have the, uh, the transition of power in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in Israel here, uh, in Judah, I'm sorry, the fifth year of Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah began to reign. So this is now Jehoram reigning in, uh, in uh, Judah. And uh, it says, uh, in, unfortunately, in verse 18, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. Now here's the problem. Jehoram, or I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat, his father was a godly king. Uh, remember that uh, Elisha 
was, was willing to do business, in a sense, with the king of Edom and the king of Israel because the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, was a godly man. And, and, and Elisha said as much as, I'm basically talking to you, and uh, it, it's only for your sake that, that I'm doing anything or giving you any prophecy or any kind of word from God because you're the godly one in this company. The other two are, are sons of Belial. And so what happened was, in, whole, in keeping company with evil uh, rulers, evil kings, uh, idolatrous and, 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 uh, and uh, false uh, worshiping kings, that Jehoshaphat exposed his son Jehoram to that, to that false worship, to that idolatry, to, that, to those golden cows that, uh, that Jeroboam had set up so many years ago. Uh, centers of false worship in Israel, and so uh, when 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 godly parents keep company with the world and and uh, allow you know ungodly uh, movies and television shows into their home and ungodly music over the radio and uh, keep company with ungodly people who have ungodly conversations, uh, that's bound to rub off on your on your uh, progeny. That's bound to rub off on your children, and uh, God forbid that. Even though you, being a godly parent, uh, keep company with ungodly people, your salvation's intact, but God forbid that your children are then led astray and they fall into false worship and idolatry because of the company that their godly parents keep. Let's, let's be very, very uh, careful about that. So uh, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. And remember, uh, as J. Vernon McGee uh, summarized, and as you can find out in Scripture, there were no good kings in Israel. All of them, all of them over the, uh, who reigned over the ten northern tribes were wicked, idolatrous, and, and uh, godless kings. So, uh, unfortunately, he takes the, the side of godlessness, and um, he did evil in sight of the Lord. Then, uh, yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him all way a light and to his children. And then it says in verses 20 through 22 that Edom revolted, and that's a fulfillment of the blessing and prophecy that their father Isaac made over, over Esau. He said, you'll throw off your, you'll serve your brother, and then you'll throw off his yoke. And that's exactly what happens in this, uh, in this case. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Uh, then Libna revolted at the same time. Now, uh, Jehoram is, uh, since he followed in the ways of the kings of Israel, he's, there's not much to say about him. Uh, he, he's just kind of a, a non-factor, except that he, uh, he fell into wicked, wicked idolatry. Now, then, uh, then uh, it says, in the, this is uh, the reign of Ahaziah in Judah. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. So this is Jehoram's... Uh, son, a, uh, Joram, so Jehoram and then Joram, his son, uh, both uh, this, Joram succeeded Jehoram in, in Judah, and uh, it says his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel, and he, now this is another king of Judah, this is supposed to be the, the godly line of David. He walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went uh, with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, king of Syria, and Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. And he went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah, when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. Elisha the prophet called uh, one of the children of the prophets, and then he says, now you're going to go and you're going to anoint one of the captains of Israel, Jehu. You're going to anoint him secretly. You're going to take him privately into a room and you're going to anoint him. There's going to be no fanfare. There's going to be uh, no proclamation. There's going to be no, no feast given. You're just going to take him aside and anoint him quietly. And uh, so this prophet girds up his loins and goes, <clears throat> and uh, it says uh, in verse 6, He arose, went unto the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of this, all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. So uh, he considers all the work of the ungodly kings of Israel to be, have been the hand of Jezebel. Remember, she's been floating in the background. She's been kind of quiet and laying low, 
ever since the son of Ahab put away uh, the, the uh, image of Baal, and kind of put him in the closet somewhere, didn't destroy it, just put it away. Now she's been laying low and keeping quiet, but according to God, she's been still pulling the strings. These, these kings, the successive kings of Israel have been her puppets, her marionettes. And uh, even though unseen, she's still uh, kind of, uh, she's still, uh, she's still running the show. So be very careful of anyone that floats in the background that kind of just pops up every now and then and you don't really think about them much. They, they could be the ones that are actually pulling the strings, running the show. Uh, that's the case with Jezebel. And it says, The whole house of Ahab shall perish. I will cut off from Ahab him that, and this is the, this is the uh, phrase that uses pissed against the wall. That means uh, someone who stands up to pee, and that would be the men, the males. Uh, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. I, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. So these are desolate and, and ruined homes, ruined houses. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So he makes this, uh, he pours the oil on uh, Jehu, he anoints him king, makes this prophecy, and remember that Jezebel's doom was prophesied way back in, in uh, 1 Kings, when Elijah, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was still 2 Kings, uh, yeah, it was 1 Kings, back in 1 Kings, when Elijah confronted her and Ahab over the uh, forcible taking of Naboth's vineyard by, uh, by false witness and then by stoning, that uh, he prophesied her doom, and it's taken through the end of 1 Kings and into, uh, well into 2 Kings for this to happen. But uh, uh, the, um, the scripture says that uh, their, their uh, judgment uh, of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So uh, just because God's taken his time on, on destroying the enemies that he said he would, doesn't mean it's not going to be sure and certain when it happens. And uh, we're going to find out it is sure and certain in Jezebel's case. Now, um, now uh, Jehu came forth to the servants of, of his Lord, and, and he told them what had happened. He's been anointed king. And then uh, it says that they started uh, riding hard. In verse 16 of chapter 9, it says, Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. Uh, and uh, Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. So you have Ahaziah and Joram, Joram king of Israel, Ahaziah, king of Judah. Uh, they, there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. Now, uh, this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his church returning at the end of the Great Tribulation uh, to just wipe out uh, the, uh, the man of sin, man of perdition, and all his uh, warriors. This is prophesied, well, it was prophesied centuries before by the prophet Enoch, the seventh from Adam, but it is recorded for us in the book of Jude, uh, probably one of my, well, if not my favorite, then one of my favorite books in the entire scripture. And it says in Jude verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of, of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners has spoken against him. So this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ returning with his saints, with his church, with his bride, after having received them to himself in heaven, uh, and after having uh, tried their works done in the body, and, and uh, whatever remained after the judgment fire was then rewarded, the saints then cast those crowns and rewards at their Savior's feet, uh, for he is due all glory and honor. And then at the end of the, uh, the marriage feast or marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, he says, okay, uh, uh, okay uh, bride, okay, men and women, okay, sons and daughters, let's saddle up. We've got a, uh, an enemy to, to lay waste to, to slaughter. And so Jehu and his company coming riding uh, down the valley towards uh, Ahaziah and Joram picture uh, the Lord Jesus Christ returning with his church and what Enoch prophesied, behold, behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That is a great company. And by the way, the old uh, camp song She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. Uh, she'll be riding six way to horses when she comes, and I'm not sure all the other verses. That's a, that's a song about the church, <laughs> the church returning at the end of the Great Tribulation uh, to set up the, the kingdom of, of Christ. And the beauty of it is we all ride behind Jesus. Uh, Jehu was at the front of this company in his chariot, 
and the saints all ride behind Jesus. And by the time uh, we get to the battle, as it were, Jesus has already laid them out uh, with, with a sword coming from his mouth. He's just slaughtered the enemy ahead of him, and we got nothing left to do but pick up the spoils. So uh, this is a picture of the, the battle of Armageddon when the Lord Jesus Christ at long last returns to set up his kingdom. Uh, in verse 19, the, or in the succeeding verses, the king kept out, kept sending out messengers, and they were riding out to Jehu to meet him in the way, and saying, uh, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Now the world's peace is, let's do away with the cross of Jesus Christ and the victory that he won on behalf of sinners who trust in him. Let's do away with that, and then we can have peace here on, on the earth. And wouldn't you know it that the peace symbol is an inverted cross with its arms broken, showing that we're going to turn the cross of Jesus Christ on its head and then break its arms or its power uh, so that the world can have peace. That, that the world has complete, got it completely backwards. When you and I come to the cross of Jesus Christ, uh, to, to the place where he shed his blood on our behalf, and we humbly bow and admit our sinfulness and humbly and faithfully look to his sacrifice as the payment of our redemption and then look to his empty tomb of resurrection as our uh, promise of the inheritance of eternal life, then we have peace with God. The world says, let's do away with all that stuff that Jesus did so that we can have peace here on earth. Uh, those wicked and despotic uh, people, and it says Jehu uh, responded to them, what hast thou to do with peace? You know, there's a, uh, a, a reference uh, from the King James Bible in front of the United Nations buildings in New York City, New York, and uh, it says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. What a wicked uh, uh, stealing and misapplication of the Word of God to, to uh, cry, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, to say peace and safety. Try to have it without God. Try to just have it among ourselves. Try to have the benefits of heaven without uh, surrendering to the God of heaven. And, uh, and he says, you don't have anything to do with peace. Either get out of the way or get mown down. That's, that's, that's the God of peace coming to claim his kingdom. And uh, uh, so, Jor so the king uh, Joram... Uh, went down there, and he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? We can't have peace. There's an enemy afoot. Uh, there's an enemy at work who is leading people to worship false gods and to sacrifice their children to false gods and to forsake the true and living God in favor of idols. We can't have peace until that's dealt with. And, uh, and so... Uh, Jehu, uh, in verse 24, drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow went out of, at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. And uh, so then uh, he, Jehu said to his captain Bidkar, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite, for remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. So he said, It's time to fulfill God's prophecy. Let's cast him into the vineyard that his father Ahab stole by force and murder, and, uh, and fulf thus fulfill God's prophecy. Then, uh, it says in verse 27, When Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by uh, Ibliam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. Megiddo being Armageddon, the valley at the foot of the mountain Megiddo. And uh, so he's going to die there along with all the rest of the ungodly people who stand against Christ and his church. Uh, then they carried him to Jerus in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him uh, with his fathers in the city of David. And then uh, he has Jezebel. Jezebel greets him with a, uh, with a stern word of uh, defiance uh, from a tower. And he says, who is on my side? Uh, and uh, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trode her underfoot. Now, once again, in the, uh, in, in the uh, follow-up or, the, or the, the cleanup of the Battle of Armageddon, we turn to Revelation 14.20. Fourteen nineteen, Revelation fourteen nineteen, the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So this is 
this, this is the grapes or, or the, the grape juice which represents blood which is going to be trodden out underfoot of God himself. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even under the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So sixteen hundred furlongs, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. That gives you, uh, and, and the same thing in uh, verse 33 of Second Kings 9, it says, the blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. Uh, that gives you blood up to the horse's bridles in a valley running 200 miles long. 1,600 furlongs divided by one-eighth of a mile each uh, gives you, leaves you with 200 miles, uh, a, a river of blood <laughs> up to the horse's bridles. And so uh, you, either you could say it was splattered onto the horses as it was in, uh, in 2 Kings 9, or you could say it was a river that flowed up to the horse's bridles uh, as it looks to be in Revelation 14:20, but either way, a space 200 miles long, uh, there's horse, there's blood up to the horse's bridles. That's a lot of mowing down, a lot of uh, uh, treading underfoot, a lot of the wine press of God's wrath. That is a whole lot of slaughter <laughs> at the hands of God Himself of those who uh, not only worshipped and serve false gods, but led others in the ungodly worship and service of false gods. So uh, that's, that's kind of the overview, and uh, with God's help, I'll make another video here uh, shortly to post on the same day about uh, Jezebel and her false worship. So may God add its blessing and power as we seek to, uh, to, to align ourselves with the worship of the true and living God and have none of the uh, trappings of false idolatrous worship uh, invade our hearts and minds. Amen.